everyone. So yes, I'm Karen Verspore, and as you heard, I've been working on natural language processing for a long time. And predating the uh, arrival of ChatGPT by a few decades, um, I've been trying to use natural language processing to help scientists find information and navigate information. And the beautiful thing about ChatGPT is that finally my dad understands somewhat what I do. <laughs> Yay. Um, but today I want to talk to you about how we're using natural language processing and other machine learning methods, but primarily natural language processing in the context of biomedical evidence, detection, search, synthesis, and discovery. And honestly, I have too much to tell you, um, and I probably didn't do a great job of pruning down my slides to fit the time. So I'm going to do the best that I can, and I might have to gloss over a few things along the way. Do I have a clicker? Is this my clicker? All right, excellent. OK, so where do we start? Um, actually, Chang already introduced some of the concepts around um, leveraging evidence this morning. So he talked about using observations um, in the form of data and then using that to drive understanding and um, conclusions. And that's basically the whole point of most clinical research, right? We're trying to develop um, guidelines and um, um, develop best practices for, for guiding how we treat human beings in a clinical context. And we do that by collecting evidence and testing um, different, different options that we have. And biomedical research more broadly really aims to understand you know, why things work as well as how well do they work. And so there's lots of questions and that's the whole point of, of, um, of the research enterprise here. So evidence is, in a nutshell, scientific conclusion. So thanks, Cheng, for setting me up. <laughs> but that's basically what it's all about. And in the context of, of clinical research in particular, um, we really see evidence-based medicine as turning to the literature. So the gold standard of evidence is randomized control trials that are done uh, um, across varying populations and published in a scientific paper which is peer reviewed and checked for the quality of that evidence. And as we go up this evidence hierarchy, we get more and more reliable evidence. So at the very top, the pinnacle of evidence in, in a clinical context is a systematic review, which combines the, the outcomes of various studies and does a meta-analysis to understand the, um, the pros and cons or the, or the significance of an effect in a particular population. This, of course, is based on the scientific method. Um, and so we need to look to the literature in order to drive this whole process, um, this virtuous cycle that Chang also mentioned this morning, um, because that is where we are capturing this information. And so the research literature is, is um, a really important part of how we do science. I mean, all of us publish our science, and all of us hope that other people will read the conclusions that we've drawn from, from the experiments that we do, and we'll use that to inform the next step of our research. That is how the process works. And so if we look at PubMed, which is the primary repository of the, the biomedical literature, and there's actually a whole bunch of other kinds of science in there as well, but it's primarily biomedical, um, it has been growing exponentially over the, over the last several decades. And I used to update the, that graph every year when I gave talks because it's, it's, you know, it's a trend that I want to highlight. And I just kind of threw my hands up in the air and gave up because um, you know, the trend is not changing. <laughs> and um, at the moment, I did take the screenshot last night of, of PubMed and it tells us that there are 35 million citations currently indexed in PubMed. And so I ask you, how many papers a week can you read? How much of this literature, how much of this evidence do you think you can find? Pretty small amount, right? So enter a bit of AI and we can, we can start working on that. So one thing that we learned during COVID is that um, the standard paradigm for searching this 
this massive amount of literature um, didn't really suit us. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, but I was kind of amused to, to get um, an email from, from a journalist at Science Magazine asking me about this. He's like, oh, how can we navigate? I said, look, we've been doing this for 20 years. This is not a new thing. It's just that now you all have finally caught up with us and realized that you need our tools. Um, I'll come back to it. So what are we doing in this space? We, I'll start with evidence detection. And really what we're trying to do when we talk about detecting evidence is organizing the information that is there. So we know the evidence exists in these scientific publications. It's just that we don't know exactly where it is, right? So we need to hone in on the key pieces of information that are relevant for us. And what we, in fact, do is we look for very specific kind of terms and relationships between them. So in the biomedical space, often we're interested in drugs and diseases and proteins and genes and the interactions between them. And so that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to take this mess of papers and find the key entities that are mentioned in them and then structure it in a way that we can then use to help people find the information better. So I think of it as organizing knowledge because it's really all the knowledge is in there. It's in the papers. We just need to structure it in a way that makes it easier to find. The traditional paradigm, of course, is to use key terms. And if we look at a, a kind of uh, library guidance for, for how we might approach um, um, querying of the literature and finding things in the literature, we see examples like this. And if you look carefully at the example up there, um, there are spelling mistakes accommodate, accommodated in there, and there's sort of all sorts of variants. And the, the work um, for generating this query is on the user. The user has to think about all the different ways that you might be able to pr express a particular concept in the text. And it's actually pretty simplistic, right? We're just saying match this, this key phrase um, and, and hoping that that's going to help us find um, what we're looking for. Um, but we know from our work that actually recognizing these, these concepts can be quite tricky. Um, and so um, uh, um, what we're trying to do is actually leverage natural language processing to help us hone in on the kinds of concepts. And we can use um, context information. We can use information from ontologies, actually, uh, to help us. So let me give you a, an example um, of that. So imagine that you are interested in, in um, biological information and particularly gene function. You might be working with the gene ontology, which captures uh, the descriptions of essentially gene functions and protein functions. And there's a term in the gene ontology um, which has identifier 6,900, 6, um, which corresponds to the term membrane budding. And actually, it's a great vocabulary. The gene ontology has over 50,000 terms in it. It's very rich. And it's been a collective effort from a huge community of bioinformaticians to define this terminology. And they've captured a definition, a kind of canonical name, and a whole bunch of synonyms. And this is a really great starting point for us, because what we can do is look for all those synonyms and then essentially try to normalize them. So every time we see one of membrane evagination or non-selective vesicle assembly or vesicle biosynthesis, we can say, right, that's an occurrence of the term membrane budding. And we can abstract it from the actual language that's in the, in the, in the paper up to a, um, an identifier, which then we can index and stick in that database and, and make available. Now, of course, in the real world, um, that synonym list is incomplete. And it doesn't capture all the different ways that we might express these things. And in particular, the gene ontology um, captures mostly nouns, right? It captures phrases like membrane budding. But what if you have um, a sentence that expresses that concept in an active way? So the budding of membranes. That's not going to match in sort of an exact match. So we can come up with strategies for um, allowing a sort of fuzzy match into, into the um, dictionary, as it were, in order to allow us to do that abstraction and standardization of, of the information. This is something that's also critical 
in the clinical context. So um, there's actually an amazing resource that was developed by the National Library of Medicine in the United States called the Unified Medical Language System, which involves, which captures um, a huge amount of, of um, clinical concepts, and some examples are, are here. And you can just go through and essentially annotate um, all of this text that's out there in the literature, trying to normalize the mentions of particular concepts into the standard identifier space. So we're organizing the information. Now, if we come back to the cl clinician or the clinical researcher who's trying to, to tackle this, this problem of finding relevant evidence and relevant information in the literature, um, we come back to how clinical research is done and structured. So the, clinical, the typical clinical research question involves something called the PICO structure. Um, PICO stands for P, patient or population. Who are we doing a study on? I, intervention. What is the actual intervention, a drug or a therapy or so, and so on, that we are wanting to test in that population? The control we generally ignore, um, although it's very important for the scientific method, but for searching purposes, it's sort of hard to search for a negative, so we kind of put that one aside. And the outcome of interest, that is, um, that is very relevant. So defining the PIO, the population, the intervention of the outcome, is a nice encapsulation of um, a clinical research study. And really, a, every clinical research, not every, but most clinical research can um, boil down to a question such, or an objective such as, to assess the effects of the intervention compared to some comparison for a condition in a population in some context on outcomes. And really, that's almost every clinical research study. So if we can map the concepts and the terminology and the descriptors of these populations and interventions and outcomes into a kind of standardized form, then we can allow people to frame their queries into the literature in terms of those concepts rather than having to make up all of these long lists of keyword terms. And so there's been a bunch of work leveraging natural language processing to identify pieces of text in the scientific publications that correspond to those elements, population descriptors, intervention, intervention descriptors, and, and so on. And um, here I'm showing a, a, a snippet of a corpus that was developed called the Evidence-Based Medicine Corpus, um, where, where humans went through and said, this is a population statement, this is an intervention statement, this is an outcome statement. And then that's used to train a recognizer to identify those spans of text. And once we have a model, that recognizer, we can, we can deploy that at scale. Um, maybe we have to wait a while for the communication to happen, um, but we can do that at scale. And you know, before we know it, those 35 million publications in PubMed have been annotated with populations, interventions, and outcomes. Now we can go one step further and combine that with the more precise and specific recognition of clinical vocabulary from the UMLS. And so one of the things that I spent my hours in lockdown doing um, was actually building a system that brought those two things together. So we layered the, the PICO detection alongside of the clinical concept detection uh, using a very simple tool um, called MetaMap, which I, I just, which I threw up there earlier. And bringing those two things together meant that we could have a, um, quite a sophisticated kind of representation of what was in the literature. So we transformed the COVID literature. There's a, a resource called LitCOVID, which captures COVID-19 specific literature. And we, we layered these two sets of layers and then merged them together. So basically, we said, if you have an outcome string, and within that we have concepts we can recognize, then we can say we have hospitalization mentioned as an outcome, we have mortality mentioned as an outcome. And, and so we can organize the information that's, that's in there by, by running those, um, two, those two models and, and merging them together. So we've been playing this game for a long time. <laughs> and a lot of the work in the text mining community um, moves then from concepts into relations because we don't only care about, about the entities, right? We don't only care about mentions of diseases and drugs and, and genes and so on. We also care about how they combine together. 
And this is um, an important step forward and an important part of what we do as human beings is about making connections be between things. So if you're a protein biologist, you're interested in understanding how particular proteins interact. And you need to understand not just that two things are mentioned in the same context, but they actually um, interact with each other in some, in some way. And so we started by looking for sentences that, that describe interactions between proteins. We can identify the entities the protein mentions, and we can then look for sentences that bring them together. Um, and we can, again, layer these things on top of each other. So uh, and the example there in yellow is of a protein-protein interaction, which is then associated with a particular functional term, which in this case is a, another gene ontology identifier. And so we can say, OK, the sentence cyclin E2 interacts with CDK2 in a functional kinase complex. We can run this concept recognition, the relation recognition, and the normalization into functional information. And we can say it's a protein-protein interaction involving interactor 1, which is cyclin E2, interactor 2, which is CDK2. And that whole thing, that whole interaction is associated with a polyphosphatase kinase complex. So this is what I mean by structuring. Do you get it? <laughs> All right, good. Now we can go a little bit further and we can actually leverage the vocabularies and the ontologies that capture the, the vocabulary um, to incorporate knowledge into this process so that we can do a bit of inference. Um, so the example down at the bottom there is ACE inhibitor treats hypertension. Um, if we know that benazapril is an ACE inhibitor, then we can take advantage of that knowledge to map a sentence that involves benazapril um, into that kind of higher level representation. So we can, we, can, we can incorporate some reasoning and inference into the process by understanding the relationships that exist or the categories of information that we have. Um, so this has been applied across many, many different kinds of entities and many, many different kinds of, of relations. Here's another example. We have this title. We have this abstract. What can we extract from that? We can, we can identify particular chemical name, particular disease names, normalize them to, to um, ontology identifiers, and then capture relations between them. So it's kind of a neat trick, right? We take this mess of words, which is really complicated, and we boil it down to a bunch of structured tables in a database. That is powerful because it allows us to then query things in ways that, that are just much harder to do when you're dealing with all the variation of natural language. We've been now applying this in the context of chemical patents as well. So moving beyond relations actually into synthesis procedures. So we are working um, with Elsevier in this case, who has a database called Reaxis, which they make available to pharmaceutical companies and chemists. And it's often used in the process of doing drug discovery. Um, and essentially, the chemical patent literature is even bigger than PubMed. It's even bigger than, than the research literature. And so, uh, and it's very early information. So if we wait for things to go through peer review and to be published, we're actually going to be missing important innovations that are, that are out, um, coming on, on an ongoing basis. And so we've been applying these same kinds of techniques to transform that mess of words in the chemical patents into nicely structured information. And so we're, we're actually um, trying to identify not just um, what are the chemical mentions in, in the text, but what are they doing in the context of the description? So is it a starting material or is it a product? Is it a catalyst or is it a, is it a reactant? And so trying to, to capture the roles of these chemicals in the context of the reaction, again, allows us to kind of represent um, in a structured way the, the information that's in there. It just needs to be organized so that computers who ultimately, uh, that ultimately um, don't have intelligence, right? They need to be told what to do, um, can, can make sense of that information. OK, um, so here's an example of, of how we're doing that. So again, we take a string, a sentence. It's quite complicated. Lots of relations in, implicit in there, lots of chemical mentions. So we, we, we find the chemical mentions um, and then find how they're connected to each other in order to extract reaction steps from that, from that description. And then it goes into a database, and it's searchable. 
How do we do that? I'll just give you a little bit of sense, a little sense of it. Um, and this is work actually from, from um, 2013. So this is a while ago using old school methods. And one of the key things that we, we did in this work was to leverage the linguistic structure of the sentences. It makes sense. If you, have, if you have sentences that are describing interactions or relationships between things, we need to understand you know, what's the main verb of the sentence? What's the subject of the sentence? What's the object of the sentence? This is important for us to understand the key actors in, in an event. And we, use, we do this in a supervised way. So we have humans go through and annotate all of these relations, as I, as I um, kind of illustrated earlier. And then we, we leverage that to try to find the sentential patterns that match the, the relationships we're interested in extracting. These days, of course, we use, guess what? neural models. <laughs> and um, so there are different ways of approaching that. Um, this, is a, this is an example of an architecture that we used for that chemical synthesis problem, um, where we're leveraging a pipeline of, um, of neural models. First, we start with the entity recognition problem, find the concepts and, and entities, and then we feed that into um, a second step which tries to classify the relations. So basically, that second step is asking the question, OK, I have two entities. Are they related? And if so, how are they related? Um, and so we, we can um, build a, this pipeline that combines the two. We can also try to break the pipe a little bit and have more interaction between the two because, of course, the entities and relations interact. And so rather than having a pipeline which assumes that we've identified all the entities, we actually use the structure of the relation extraction problem to help us do a better job of finding the entities. And, um, and so this is called end-to-end -end information extraction where you're doing the whole thing in one go. All right. So that's detection. And so at the end of this process, we now have structured information that we've put into a database, capturing the key entities and relationships of interest. Um, and now we want to make it available. So I'm going to come back to the COVID-19 example because there's some interesting learnings to draw from, from, from that example. Um, you know, I talked about this kind of very structured ap approach with a clear clinical question that is the typical paradigm. What happened in COVID, and the reason I got that, that email from the journalist at Science, was because people realized that that traditional paradigm where you know what you're looking for wasn't going to work. And the basic problem was if you can wind your back, your, your head back to, to um, you know, February of 2020, we didn't know what we were dealing with. And clinicians had no idea even what the symptoms of this thing were. They had no idea how to treat things. And, um, the WHO at that time actually published this list of questions. So what they wanted to know is how we can find new insights into this, into this new disease that was emerging. What has been published about medical care? What do we know about vaccines and therapeutics? What do we know about the risk factors? What do we know about non-pharmaceutical interventions, etc.? Now, if you can think, imagine you're going into PubMed or you're going into, into Google search and you're typing in a question like vaccine COVID-19, you're not going to find anything, right? It's too generic of a question because what are all these systems designed for? They're designed for specific questions around specific interventions, um, not not this general kind of concept or, or category. And what has been published about medical care, medical care COVID, I mean, you're going to get back, you know, probably half the internet. So it's not a very useful way to, to approach the, this kind of question. Um, and, you know, you might think that the scientific literature was slow to develop in, in COVID, but actually it was phenomenally fast. So um, this is a, a, a summary of all of the COVID-related papers that were coming out. And look, there were papers coming out already in February of 2020. Isn't that wild? And you know, by the time we get to May of, of 2020, we're getting more than 2,000 papers on COVID-19 every week. It's wild, right? So I'm going to come back to that question I ask you. How many papers can you read? You're never going to find anything if you're asking these open-ended questions 
in a very large collection of literature. So I thought, all right, I have some skills. Maybe I can use my skills, and we're going to try to see if we can help this problem. And um, you know, I want you to think about that, that kind of typical mode of, of, of searching. You type into Google your very specific query, and you get back this list of results, and you start scanning you know, the first page, and then you go, well, OK, that looks relatively reasonable. I'll click on that one. Um, and then you get lost, right? And eventually you might come back to your search result and you might add a few words and make it more specific and, you know. Anyway, this is a very slow process and you never look past page one. Promise. Anyone look past page one? Okay, one person, Cecile, but she understands NLP so she knows that it's not all going to be on the first page. Um, okay, so what can we do that's not search? And so I, I thought, right, well, we can organize the information, right? We can try to go through this literature, figure out what's in there, and help surface that in a visual way for, for users. And so um, we try to transform these documents into information, leveraging the tools of natural language processing and developed a system called COVID-C, the Scientific Evidence Explorer, which we're still doing user studies on, so I don't know if it's actually useful, but I'll be able to tell you in a few months. Um, but the idea behind it was simply to support this kind of information need around having less specific queries. And so we leveraged those PICO concepts I told you about earlier. We went through, we found all of the, the the population phrases, the intervention phrases, the outcome phrases. We identified more specific concepts within them. And then we just structured that and made it available in a visual representation. So we used a Sankey diagram. I don't know if that's any good. But the idea is that a user can come in and go, OK, I've collected. It actually starts with a regular search. You collect, you get a set of results. And then you see a visualization of what's in there and by exploring the different populations that are in there and the different and the relationships um, to different interventions, it gives you a sense of what might be interesting. And so a user can come in here and, um, and click on one of those links, sorry, and um, immediately see a paper that talks specifically about the connection between lunch and quarantine. I don't know why lunch is in there, but anyway, it's in there. So if you're curious about that, you can click on that, on that um, link and immediately see the paper and the title and the abstract anyway. Um, and we put a little briefcase in there so you can add it to your briefcase and, and then collect. Still lots of work to be done on this, but the basic impetus behind this was helping to organize and, and surface the information that was in there. Like the papers are more specific than medical care, um, but just making it a bit easier to see that what was in there and help people to, to refine the questions that they're asking. And if you look through this carefully, you'll see there's lots of errors in there. And that's OK, because we're not aiming for perfection. This isn't a life or death, de death decision that's happening here. We're just trying to leverage the somewhat messy capabilities that we have. OK, so moving on to synthesis. Um, in any kind of clinical decision setting, um, we need to, to be confident that we're making decisions that are in the best interest of our patient. And in the, this typically relies on having guidelines around best practice. And as I told you before, a systematic review is the kind of the ultimate quality of, of understanding of what we need to do in particular populations with particular um, um, outcomes of interest. And so really the question is, we know the P, we kind of know the, the, the outcome we're going for, the O, what's the I, and um, what's the appropriate way to, to treat this patient. And in the process of generating these systematic reviews, there's a whole lot of work that, that researchers will do to actually sort of calibrate the evidence around uh, a particular clinical question. And in that process, they're doing what's known as quality appraisal. So they're actually assessing essentially how much do we trust the information that's in these papers. Um, and so, um, you know, we have a population, we have an intervention we might be considering um, for, for a, a, a member of a particular population, and we have an outcome that, that is the context. And um, 
The question is, do we trust hormone replacement therapy to, to treat this postmenopausal woman that's in front of me um, in the context of, of cardiovascular risk? And we cannot answer this question, really, unless we have reliable, high-quality evidence. Um, so what confidence should we have in the estimate of the scientific research that's out there by, and we can decide the answer to that question by examining the flaws in the trial design, the conduct of the research, the analysis, or the, even the reporting of the, of the research. So we have been trying to build some automated tools to support that quality assessment process because it's quite involved. Um, and essentially, if we're given a piece of evidence from, from a systematic review, we would like to try to predict the quality of that. And that's to allow us to gauge the, the, um, how much we should trust that, that piece of evidence. We're building in this on a framework which has been established in the systematic review community called GRADE, Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And it's a framework that essentially starts with um, a particular quality of evidence that's assumed um, and then um, is downgraded for basically problems in the particular clinical study. Um, and so a randomized controlled trial, as I told you, is kind of, you know, it's, it's the gold standard of, of um, research method, methodology, um, but there can be problems in, there may be biases in, in how um, the, the participants are selected, there may be small numbers, and so on and so forth. And so each one of those, those issues um, is literally a negative on the score that is given to, to the evidence in that, in, uh, ar um, arising from that study. Uh, observational studies, by the way, uh, start low and have to gain points. They have to go up. So observational studies, because they're not controlled experiments, are kind of assumed to be relatively low quality, and they can be upgraded for, um, for reasons such as having large sample size or effect size. Um, okay, and it turns out that when we, when we do some data science on the quality of medical evidence, we actually find uh, that the medical evidence is of high quality only about one-sixth of the time. And um, half of the time, the evidence is of very low quality. So this is why it becomes important for us to have tools that can help assess this, because if you're trying to make a decision about treating a patient, you want to be confident that the information you're using is meaningful. Um, and if we look at the reasons for downgrading, it's because of imprecision in the studies and risk of bias. We've heard a lot about bias today. Um, so what we did was to build um, a, a, a deep learning model which looks at the words in the systematic reviews and actually helps us to kind of um, assess and categorize the, the quality of, of the evidence. And at the moment, we're finding that the grade scoring is quite tricky and all of these dimensions of, of um, of downgrading are, are difficult um, to, to assess. Um, but we can simplify it down to a binary problem and really just look, is it high quality or low quality? And, um, and in that kind of model, um, we're, we, we can do better, obviously. It's a simpler problem. Um, and, but it's practical and it's still useful. So there's still work to be done here. You can see our, our performance is still not very good. Um, and it assumes we have a systematic review that we're working with. So the next steps of this research would be to um, be able to kind of go back to that picture I showed you a few slides ago, where actually we're, we're supporting the systematic review process um, more directly. OK. So that's evidence synthesis, because we want to be able to assess the quality of evidence across multiple, multiple studies. Um, one thing that we can do in the same kind of paradigm is to support discovery of, of new information. And we can do that by taking our literature, finding our entities, finding our relations, and then thinking of that instead of a, as a structured database as a knowledge graph that we can then interrogate and do and, and do some more data science on, right? So we can use this as the beginning um, for the next stage of, of scientific discovery. 
So we've been doing some work around generating hypotheses from the literature. And the idea is that, yep, we transform the literature into a, a, a knowledge graph that, that captures the entities and the relationships between those entities. And then we do some network analysis. We try to find the clicks in that graph. We try to find um, the, the connections that are implicit in, in the structure of the scientific research that's been published, but, but um, perhaps not um, not investigated yet, so we don't have evidence to, but, but it allows us to start identifying opportunities for the next steps of science. Um, and to give you a simple idea of what this looks like, um, you know, if we have a relationship, uh, and we have a paper that talks about a substance and an effect, and another paper that talks about uh, a relationship between that effect and the disease, um, we might ask the question, is there, is there a possible opportunity to leverage that substance in the context of treating that disease? So a specific example of this was actually um, developed manually by a scientist back in the 90s. Um, who noticed that there was a paper talking about, um, you know, the properties of fish oil in terms of um, platelet aggregation, and that Raynaud's disease was connected to platelet aggregation as well. So there were two pieces of research, and then he made this connection between them. And sure enough, when they investigated the opportunities for, for fish oil in treating Raynaud's disease, they found that it worked. And so we're trying to do this now at scale. So rather than having you know, one little transitive closure and one little triangle, um, we're actually trying to do this across all of PubMed. So um, this is work by one of my students where we're in the process of essentially taking PubMed over the last 30 years and then using it to predict into the future. And this is, involves link prediction methods um, and really trying to um, just make those inferences. It's a bit tricky. I, I put some challenges down at the bottom. This is why I don't have a citation yet because we're still working on how to make this work. When you're um, predicting into the future, even if you, if you pretend the past is the future, um, it gets kind of tricky because guess what? Science isn't done yet and um, we're going to be predicting possible relationships that haven't been validated in the literature. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is, you know, okay, obviously predicting one year, in a, one year ahead means you're only getting a very narrow view on, on the science. Um, so we need to predict, predict further into the future, but then it's a vanishing horizon kind of problem. So it's a little bit tricky. We're still working through it, but, um, but we're dealing with, you know, very, very large knowledge graphs and, and trying to think about um, how we can do this and our data sets are limited at the moment to co-occurrence relationships because that's the thing that's easiest to do. <laughs> Still work to be done. Um, okay, so I just wanted to, to make a small mention of actual um, clinical data science and how this kind of methodology can, can um, be applied in that context as well. Um, so, you know, in, in observational research in, in um, clinical data, uh, we, have, we have similar kinds of questions. We want to understand the relationships between conditions and drugs and measurements and procedures, right? We want to, we want to be able to understand from real patient data um, whether a particular treatment has um, a, an impact on, on an outcome in the context of a disease. Um, and if you think about it, you know, we can, we can do the same trick on, in um, leveraging, leveraging the text that's in the context of the, um, um, the, the, clinical, the electronic health record and map it into those concepts of um, conditions, drugs, measurements, and procedures. And so we can ask questions. Once we structure the data in these kinds of terms, we can ask questions about the relationships between them and we can measure them statistically. Um, so in the context of the electronic health record, it turns out that about 80% of the data that's in the electronic health record is actually in textual form. Um, we have clinical texts including notes, reports, letters, discharge summaries, and so on. And it's just a huge amount of documentation which is done for human purposes, right? For human communication and to support human memory um, that's captured in language. And so we have two paradigms that, that we're exploring in this context. And one is what I started off telling you about, trying to find the concepts and the relationships 
and trying to structure the, the, and organize the, the, the information that's in, in that text. And the other is to do a, a direct neural representation of all of that um, and use that in the context of, of doing prediction. Um, it turns out that sometimes all those fancy deep learning models are not necessary. And um, so we've been doing some work in the context of, of um, invasive fungal infection and immunocompromised um, 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 cancer patients. And we've actually shown that even just a simple bag of words model is better than some of these fancy neural models because of the sparsity of data that we have in this context. Um, but more importantly, if we hone in on the particular concepts that the clinicians have told us are relevant, we can, we can get almost perfect performance. In fact, if we hone in on the right concepts correctly, we can get perfect performance on this classification task. Okay, um, I'm going to have to leave a little time for questions, so I better wrap up. But if we can represent our clinical data in these kind of um, either structured or implicitly structured pattern-based neural models, then it opens up lots of opportunities for Cheng said we have a you know, mathematical digital description of the data. Well, we have a mathematical digital representation of the patient. And um, then we can do everything we can do with any other kind of data with this very complex multimodal data as long as it's been normalized into a common structure of some variety. Um, and I would like to see us moving towards what I call patients like mine. So you're a clinician. Um, you know, you're facing your, your um, Miss Orange. Who is my patient Miss Orange the most similar to? You know, is she a purple person? Is she a blue person? Is she a gray person? Uh, or, and so on. And we can do this by leveraging the tools of data science, comparing similarity between patients. Now, there's obviously a lot I'm hiding under this idea, but I think um, once we start thinking about taking data and transforming it into information that's structured, we have lots of opportunities that, that, um, that, that we can follow up on. And so I imagine kind of combining all of these things together. So we have the literature, we have um, guidelines, we have randomized control trials, we have evidence. And in the clinical setting, we can start to, to really ask in a fairly dynamic way, um, what are the opportunities? How should I be treating my patient? What's the best evidence for it? Okay. So that brings me to the end with 45 seconds for questions. Um, we need to use AI um, to uh, enable learning from this you know, really large scale data. And you know, obviously my focus today has been on the scientific literature, but we can't forget about that clinical data um, to support evidence generation, exploration, retrieval, and synthesis because AI helps us to find, infer, utilize, and I guess I should have said structure knowledge um, to support this kind of ongoing scientific process that we're all part of. So thank you very much. And lots of thanks. Round of applause, please. Aaron the floor. <laughs> thank you. That was a whistle-stop tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. Feel free, grab, grab, oh, grab, grab a seat. You. I've got a couple of questions that here, here that which rolled in for us. Um, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, and the, the, uh, my initial kind of thought was, in terms of the publications and the research that you've done, you're finding the, the uh, level of inconsistencies within the reports and so forth, which is a really lovely side kind of benefit of being able to look at these. I, I've got an overall question is, is who's peer reviewing these um, publications that, are, that end up with so much um, inconsistencies and error? Well, so th things can be sound without being high quality. So I think this is part of the answer. Um, they can pass peer review because they have, you know, they've done the right things in terms of, you know, setting up a control group and setting up a, an experiment group. But it requires a, um, a sort of putting it into the context of um, the, the broader population um, to, to really say things like, well, okay, but this study was only done in one hospital. Um, which is often the case because, because of financial considerations or because of, you know, Funding considerations, I, funding and financial is the same, but anyway, so, so, you know, there are good reasons, sometimes regulatory reasons, you know, all sorts of reasons that it could be done in a fairly narrowly scoped kind of context, which then means that, okay, it'll be relevant to that population in that hospital, but not necessarily 
you know, to the broader population. So the scientific research is still valuable and it's still valid. It's just not necessarily something you want to trust, you know, in your hospital. Excellent. Thank you for that. It, was, it, just, it was, just jumped out at me as you, as you presented. Uh, <clears throat> Tom uh, asks this. A big part of system, uh, systematic reviews is grading individual studies for quality, for example, sample size, controls, risk of bias, um, for, et cetera. Are uh, evidence finding NLP tools capable of finding the side information when they extract or summarize findings? Yeah, so that is definitely something that's being worked on. Our study here focused on, on the bodies of evidence, so the collection of evidence around a particular clinical question. Um, but the, there are tools such as, um, um, there's a tool called Robot Reviewer, um, which looks, looks specifically for risk of bias. They're, they tend to be fairly targeted to one aspect, one dimension uh, of grade. Um, and, but yeah, that's definitely another kind of um, application where we could use NLP to help classify these, these papers according to those different criteria. Uh, and just one final question on, uh, in relation to that, perhaps in addition to Tom's question, how successfully can NLP tools find inconsistencies between studies, for example, in conflicting results or interpretations? Yeah, I don't think we're doing that yet. That's really hard. <laughs> um, that's hard for humans to do, right? It, again, it requires kind of, you know, setting a, uh, understanding the boundaries, the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the, of the studies, um, and comparing that and sorting it out can be, can be quite tricky. On the other hand, again, if we can kind of organize and categorize things, then, and we understand the relationships between different populations, that gives us at least the tools for starting to be able to do that. But at the moment, it's definitely not automated. Um, and just one final one. It's not really a question, but it was, I've just been looking through the chat as well. Um, someone was mentioning that they were revisiting the uh, Kaggle uh, COVID-19 open research data set. Um, challenge and uh, to look at some literature mining, yep. um, but we're finding that they're getting inconsistent results um, that because of the machine learning uh, um, libraries had changed. Ah, <laughs> I haven't played with the the, the, the Kaggle challenge myself directly, but um, we tried. Oh gosh, that was ages ago. Um, so yeah, yeah. So there's always that problem in machine learning, isn't it? That that um, your your evaluations aren't going to be consistent if the underlying data changes. Um, so again, we have to run our own controlled experiments, right, and ensure that the versions of the of the data that we're working with are, are consistent. Um, it happens quite a lot. So I know there's some people in the room that have done um, social media analysis. Um, you know, we we can't redistribute. Twitter data, so we tend to, to um, only distribute Twitter IDs, and, and by the time you go and collect the, the actual um, tweets from the, through the API, the tweet might be gone. Uh, maybe it's been deleted, the person was you know, kicked out of Twitter, whatever it was, uh, could be gone. And, and so, you know, yeah, it creates this problem of like, how do you compare apples with spoiled apples? I don't know. We have to really be very careful about how we approach that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for coming and presenting for us. A fantastic range of information. And, uh, and thank you for sharing all of the, of the uh, information from your studies, um, which will, is of benefit to us here in the room. Thank you. Can I get a round of applause, please, for our, uh, our keynote speaker here, Dean of School of Computing, and Karen Vespore.